great place for us to uh, have fellowship. And Everything is great about the AWCF. One of the great strengths for the AWCF is that uh, uh, when you become part of the AWCF, you're becoming part of a great family. I would encourage anybody who wants fellowship and wants to understand how broad this great apostolic movement is and that you have brothers and sisters from all over the world. AWCF is the only group of fellowship of men who come together out of love and not of necessity. They come because they want to, not because they're compelled to. You, know, you get to meet so many uh, apostolic brethren and uh, sisters from all over the world, uh, and the fellowship is uh, it's great. You died, you died for me. The Apostolic World Christian Fellowship brings together over 180 different denominations, not including 
independent ministries and pastors that come together and sit at fellowship and unity and brotherhood. It is not an organization. It's simply a brotherhood of people that believe in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. I've been so blessed the last few years. He was a friend of my father. And after losing my father, the security and the peace and the comfort that I know that I have a man like Bishop Smith in my life as a covering and a protection and an elder. And we know that we're going to hear from the Lord today. Would you welcome Bishop Samuel Smith? Thank you, Brother Suber. Let's stand to our feet, if you would, please, and raise your hands and seek the favor of God, the anointing of God from this moment on throughout the remaining part of the last thing that's said tonight. Let's pray. Let's seek the face of God. We've sung, we've worshiped. Let's raise our hands and voices and cry out for 30 seconds at least. Let's make contact. Praise the Lord. Give him a hand, praise, would you please? Everyone. Thank you. You may be seated. It's an honor to be with you today. We appreciate Bishop Phillips, the staff of this great church, for what they're doing. I will save other comments for another time. Let me start right now to redeem my time I have this morning. In Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, we find a profound occurrence. Usually the disciples were asking Jesus questions, though on this particular occasion he asked the apostle Peter, whom do you say that I am? And the apostle answered, thou art the Christ. And the Lord said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Number one, there was a revelation of the identity of Jesus. Number two, there was an assignment that the gates of hell would not prevail against him and those that have that revelation. Folks, we are the repository of the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There is one Lord, there is one faith, and there is one baptism. Years ago, a friend of mine preached a small camp meeting in, in the Bible Belt, and he told it was an open air uh, facility, and he was preaching on the crucifixion of Jesus that night, and he was quite a word master. He was painting a picture of, of Jesus being taken from Gethsemane and being accused and, and beaten and all the details, and he painted a picture of Christ being led up Calvary, but it was late. The service had gone on for a while. He saw people begin to walk out. And after a while, he saw the cars in the parking lot, the headlights come on, and people were leaving, and there was more and more people leaving. So finally, he just began to shift his message, and he, he told about a little boy with a puppy and how the little boy grew up with this puppy, and they were best friends, and they were pals, and one day the puppy got ran over and the little boy was weeping over the puppy. He noticed people stopped going out and the people actually were standing by the cars watching to how the story's gonna end. And the preacher said at that point he couldn't take it anymore and he said, when we walk out on the blood of Jesus and we weep over a dead puppy, we have become dim lights to a dark world. Folks, let me tell you something today, we're living in the post-Christian uh, era in America. We're living a time when the world is becoming antichrist. Nation is becoming against nation. Israel has become a troublesome stone, a, a prophecy when the whole world is turning against it. There is a conventional wisdom throughout the world to try a, a, a new era. The antichrist will come riding on the wings of an appetite for a whole different system of government, but there is a rock solid basis of the truth that never changes. The Bible says they that know their God in the last days, they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. I'm here to tell you apostolic is not a dirty word. I'm here to tell you there is still power in the name of Jesus. I'll tell you that sins are remitted in the name of Jesus. 
Water baptism is essential. I didn't say this. I didn't make it up. There are not ten suggestions. There are ten commandments. The new birth is not a suggestion. It is a commandment. You must be born again of the water and the spirit. Folks, there's an appetite in the heart of man. When Paris Hilton was going to jail, she got a Bible. When she was having claustrophobic attacks, she turned to the Bible. Isn't it strange after 9-11, people were saying, God bless you and let's pray. Folks, in the deepest recesses of the drug pusher and the prostitute and the deepest sinner, there is something deep in there. I need God. If we want revival, we got to pine after the promise of God. And that is that men must be born again, and we have got the keys. Who did Jesus give the keys to? He gave them to the apostle Peter. He said, what you bind will be bound, and what you loose will be loosed. If there was ever a time when radical Islam, if there was ever a time when the drug epidemic, if there was ever a time when the spirit of infidelity, if there was ever a time when sin needs to be bound, it's today. It's going to take more than Nancy Reagan saying, just say no. It's going to take more than putting millions of dollars uh, to fight drugs. Uh, this nation needs a revival. A man of God a few years ago had a vision in the 1970s. Uh, he said in prayer he saw a, a horrible slime begin to creep across America from one coast to the other coast and, uh, and, from, and from Canada down to Mexico and the big cities and the small cities. He said it was everywhere. It was in, in high-rise apartments. It was in the slums. It was in office buildings. He said doctors and lawyers and, and, and the common people. It was a slime. And he said the Lord showed him it was drugs. This was in the early 70s. And he said that nothing would work. Nothing would push it back. And then he saw churches and, and fire coming from heaven and striking the altar and touching people. And the people left the churches. And, and wherever they went, fire came from their mouths and from their fingertips. And, and the slime was pushed back. That was almost 40 years ago. We're living in a nation where drugs is everywhere. Drugs is everywhere. Do you know the biggest business in America today, bigger than General Motors, bigger than Chrysler, bigger than Ford, is pornography. Pornography and drugs go together. It's an epidemic. It's a slime. And nothing is working. It's called Generation X. Hip-hop, rap. VH1, MTV, it's everywhere. Nothing is working, but I still believe there is something that will work. The gospel of Jesus works. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. I like what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I am a debtor. The Apostle Paul knew he owed God something. He owed the Jews something. He owed the Gentiles something. He owed Caesar something. He owed the beggar something. He owed the world something. He was a debtor. I look today at people who have the revelation, who have the keys, who have the knowledge of the truth. Hear ye, O Israel, Lord, our God is one. Jehovah Shammah, Jehovah Rapha. There is no Jehovah Junior. I believe there is one God. They that know him shall be strong and do exploits. We're debtors. Somebody's got to tell somebody about this truth. Somebody's got to tell somebody there is power only in the name of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of gospel. It's the power of God under salvation. I want to say it again. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God under salvation. I want to say it thrice. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God under salvation. Somebody put your hands together and begin to applaud the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was preaching in South Africa a few years ago, and during the daytime I had some time to shop, and I 
went to a, a wood carver and I made conversation with him and told him I was preaching a conference there in Pretoria. The beautiful thing was that there was apartheid for years and now it's come down and the blacks and the whites and the colors and the Indians are all able to worship together legally. We take this for granted here, but that was a breakthrough over there. And the, the conference was mighty. There was a mix of the cultures and the services. We were, we were praising Jesus and doing what we do best, lifting up his name. And I, I invited this wood carver and, uh, to come to our service that night. And he came. Honest to God, I'm telling the truth. If I'm lying, God's just strike me dead. He sat in the middle of the, of the auditorium. And I preached that night, nothing new or strange, what we, we call old hat here. But it was new to him. And as I preached halfway through my message, Bishop Phillips, this is the truth. Halfway through my message, this man leaped to his feet with emotion. He said, Bishop, Bishop, I get it. It's Jesus. You say, what's so great about that? His name was Ali. Ali was a Muslim. We baptized Ali. Ali received the Holy Ghost. Folks, our country's in trouble today. We'll never convert radical Islam with bombers and the Marine Corps. They'll find some way to fight back an IED is smarter than a smart bomb. The ingenuity of those radicals will never defeat them. We've made a despiteful mistake. We should have been evangelizing. There's still time. This gospel must be preached. Didn't say ought to be. Didn't say should be. It must be preached in the whole world before Jesus comes back. This has been the vision and burden of Bishop Phillips since I knew him as a young man to preach this gospel, not to hide it under a bushel, not to be closed in a box, not to take the comfortable way out, but to be a pace setter. We are his sons and grandsons, and now we've been brought together an hour such as this. But let us purpose in our hearts that we have time yet to reach the gospel to the whole world. I was in Ethiopia a few months ago, Brother Phil, Brother Barr and I were together. Until you've been there, it is indescribable. 500,000 people, day after day, all day, worshiping and praising God. Have they compromised? Have they changed the gospel? They believe in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Baptism in Jesus' name, speaking in tongues, the blind see, the deaf hear, the crippled dance, the miracles are taking place, the dead are rising. There are today three million believers of this great message in Ethiopia because they're not ashamed and the power of God follows them where they proclaim it. Bishop Tecumerium was in Miami at a special service where I was just this past weekend. The years of being in prison and being beaten and being persecuted has taken a toll on him. You've no doubt seen him here. As the Apostle Paul, he bears in his body the marks and the wounds and scars of years of wear and tear. Sometimes you can hardly hear his voice. It's, 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 it's tired and worried. You know who I'm talking about. But he made a statement from behind the pulpit. He said, there are no doors closed to us today. I got to thinking about it. I know Filipinos who are domestic workers in Saudi Arabia who have underground churches. There are domestic workers now all through Israel from, from the Far East, Koreans and, and Filipinos that are being great witnesses and having thriving churches in Israel. And their employers, the rich old Jews, the rich old Jews have, have seen the nation besieged time and again by Arab attacks and now they're at wit's ends. And they're saying, tell me about Jesus. Folks, there are no doors closed and from Afghanistan. I have preached in Cuba. I have preached all through Russia. I have preached all through, through, through Bulgaria. There are no doors closed. This is our time. We've got the internet. We've got airplanes. We've got television. 
We, 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 we've got closed circuit. We've got every, every opportunity. We've got telephones, radios, television. There is no excuse. We are commissioned. We must preach the gospel today. That's why we're here. I never saw the movie Titanic. I never saw it. If you have, fine. I have no problem with that, but I haven't. But I've read lots of things about the sinking of Titanic. I read one time some trivia about it. I don't consider it trivia. But they say that night when there was only a few people that could escape because there was a limited amount of lifeboats and the rest were doomed to go down with the ship. And you've all heard the story. The last thing that the, the orchestra played on the Titanic was uh, uh, nearer my God to thee. Folks, when people are facing the end, they turn conscious towards God. The Bible says hell hath enlarged itself. The reason Walmart enlarges is because they're expecting growth. The devil is expecting growth and he's getting it, but there is a factor that can change that. Bishop Phillips, we are going to reach the world. We have got to reach the world because people have something in the heart waiting. Is there not a prophet in the land? Is there not someone else besides the prophets of Micaiah? Is there not a voice from God? Yes, there is. There is a voice in the churches across America that know the truth and we are challenged and we're changed. Like the moth, we become the butterfly. We are ready to fly like the eagle. We're ready to proclaim this great message. There is a destiny we've got to pursue. But that night as the Titanic was about to sink beneath the cold surface and the orchestra was playing nearer my God to thee, somehow or another on those few lifeboats it was communicated when it certainly would happen when the Titanic would sink, they were all going to scream. Why? Why were they going to scream? I'm talking about the survivors on the lifeboats were all going to scream in unison. The reason was is because they knew there would be a death cry from those that were going to sink. And if they could somehow or another scream louder, they wouldn't hear it go down. Please don't judge me. I'm not judging you. I love loud worship. I love victory marches. I love leaping for joy. I love our talent. I love our PA systems. I love our powerful preaching. But we got to be careful that with all the noise we're making, we don't drown out the cries of the lost. The lost is crying. The lost is crying. Somebody throw me a life, boy. Somebody throw me a rope. Please do not subscribe to the conventional wisdom of our time to put the ox cart on a, uh, put the ark on an ox cart. It may have pretty wheels. It may be what other people are doing, but the ark is moved upon the shoulders of a royal priesthood. The people who know their God, the people that love truth, the people that have never bowed a knee to Baal, the people that know their God, and God knows them. I believe throughout this place today, I am standing among the select. There are people here that your name is known in heaven, and your name is known in hell. That's why the devil's put a target upon your back. He knows your potential. And at the same time, the Lord is saying to Gabriel and Michael, I'm going to bless them. I'm going to anoint him. I'm going to anoint her. I'm going to use them. I'm going to raise them up. They are my mouthpiece. I'm going to give them favor. I'm going to show the world what I will do with them. This is the time to introduce them. Folks, the curtain's about to pull back and the greatest revival. The greatest revival the world has seen is going to be spawned up in the altars of, of true churches and the fire will go forth and push back the gates of hell and souls will be set free. 
I've often said Lot is not one of my favorite characters in the Bible. We could go into Lot's problems. We won't do that today. But the Bible said he was called righteous Lot because he was vexed. I mean, if he got called righteous because he was vexed at his world, my God, are we vexed? Does anybody else besides me get tired of hearing about Anna Nicole Smith? Does anybody here beside me get tired of hearing about Britney Spears? Anybody here besides me get tired of hearing about, 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 about uh, Paris Hilton? Is anybody else here tired about hearing about Tom Cruise and Scientology? Folks, uh, behind the glitter of entertainment tonight, behind HBO, behind the Hollywood stars and starlets, uh, there is corruption, there is addiction, there is thievery, there is murder. Has anybody noticed the epidemic of, of missing wives and mothers and beheadings and disembowelments and stranglings and buried in graves? And uh, uh, the other day, when they found this young woman in Ohio that had been killed by her boyfriend, and uh, he had four children by different women, and he was shacking up with a bunch of others, and this was her second baby with him, and they weren't married, and, and they finally found her, and Geraldo was talking to one of the experts, a forensic doctor, about the state of her decay, and they were talking about she had been in the grave, and how that the insects were probably, had started to make it difficult to find out her, her, her cause of death. And I thought, the wages of sin is death. Roll back the clock a couple years ago when her and her boyfriend were meeting for secret rendezvous. Roll back the clock a few years ago when they were having candlelight dinners when he was slipping out on his wife. And roll back the clock a few years ago when they were having sweet nothings in each other's ears. It was good then, but if she could have rolled the clock ahead two years and seen on CNN and Fox uh, the, 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 the pictures of her body being dug out of a unknown grave and people talking about the state of her decomposition and the bugs crawling through her body. I'm telling you, sin is ugly. I'm telling you, sin is terrible. It's time we get angry at sin. It's time we become angry at sin. I like what the Bible says. Soon the God of peace shall cross beneath your feet the devil. Come on, somebody. We ought to get excited about our gifts. We're excited about our, our potential. We're excited about our assignment. But are there some warriors here today? Some folks who say, I've had it. I'm tired of it. Enough is enough. I am going to make war on the floor. I've got the promise. I've got the tools. I know my purpose. And I'm going to get the job done. Thank you for joining us today for Come Home America, brought to you by the Apostolic World Christian Fellowship, a worldwide international affiliation of ministers everywhere. Stop by our headquarters sometime, 421 North Main. We love to show you around. Our local support and affiliate church is Grace Point Church, 11 West Iowa Street, here in the city. On behalf of Pastor Luke Smith, Sister Anna Smith, all the membership and staff, we welcome you to visit us as soon as possible. Our contact information and location is found on the screen. Pay attention to it. Come out and visit us. We'd love to have you. Until next time, we pray for you and you pray for us. Remember, Grace Point is a church in the heart of the city with the city at heart. God loves you and so do we. Until the next time, God be with you in Jesus' name. Amen.